So we start with our morning keynote address from Emily Tornaresos, which is called The State of Cancer Survivorship, with a focus on the National Cancer Institute portfolio of Hodgkin lymphoma research. Dr. Tornaresos has a master's in public health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, in addition to her MD qualifications from the University of Rochester School of Medicine. She completed her training grades at Columbia University Medical Center and Johns Hopkins, and she currently serves as director of the Office of Cancer Survivorship, which is part of the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. In this position, she leads NCI's efforts to address the challenges facing cancer survivors and their families, to prevent or mitigate adverse effects and to improve the health and well-being of cancer survivors from the time of diagnosis through the remainder of their lives. Dr. Tornaresos previously worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the Weill Cornell Medical College, New York, where she was director of the adult long-term follow-up program for survivors of childhood and young adult cancers. Her research focuses include met cardiometabolic consequences of cancer therapy, and childhood and young adult cancer survivorship and have been funded amongst others by the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society and the American Institute of Cancer Research. She's involved with the Children's Oncology Group long-term follow-up guidelines and is co-leader of the International Guideline Harmonization Group for the Metabolic Syndrome. She's also served on numerous national and international committees and work groups. In short, Emily Tormoresos is extremely qualified and experienced to speak to us about the state of cancer survivorship. Please welcome her to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for the long introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me today. This is obviously an amazing meeting and it's an incredible opportunity for me. I'm really quite grateful to be here. I just want to get started by saying a little bit about the Office of Cancer Survivorship, and I'm going to tell you more about what we're doing. But the Office of Cancer Survivorship was founded about 27 years ago in response to cancer advocates. And it really was people like you, in fact, some of the people who are in this room, who came to the National Cancer Institute director at the time, Richard Klausner, and said, we want a place at NCI for survivorship research. And so he initiated the Office of Cancer Survivorship. There was a rose ceremony, a, a ceremony in the Rose Garden where um, President Clinton at the time announced the formation of the office. And since then, the Office of Cancer Survivorship has been working on behalf of survivorship research at the National Cancer Institute. Yes. Oh. There is one here, thank you. So if you're wondering um, what is my government doing for me, um, you're looking at it, and this is it. <laughs> but um, it is, I just wanted, I just want you all to know that that's what we're here for and that's what we're doing. And it was um, directly in response to what advocates came to NCI and said. So what you're doing today is very important and there are people listening, including myself. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what's going on in survivorship right now, what's happening specifically in Hodgkin lymphoma survivorship and what we have coming up. So you probably know that June is National Cancer Survivor Month. I don't know how you guys feel about that month. Um, we do have a lot of events central, uh, centered around the month of June through the Office of Cancer Survivorship, but um, I would be curious to hear what you, how that feels to you and what you think about that. We use a definition of the cancer survivor that comes from the advocacy community. It says an individual is considered a cancer survivor from the time of diagnosis through the balance of life. And my immediate predecessor, who you may know, Dr. Deb Mayer, she updated this definition to specifically say that survivors include those who are living with cancer and those who are free of cancer. And as a result of that work, we have focused a lot of our energy in the first few years since I have been at the Office of Cancer Survivorship on this growing population of people who are living with advanced and metastatic cancer. So I'm not gonna talk about that at all today, but that has been a big um, focus of our work recently. 
Let's see, these are new figures. You may think you've seen this figure before, but you haven't. <laughs> this is um, about to come out in JNCI, some work that we've done to update our cancer prevalence numbers. And as you see in the United States, the cancer prevalence is rising. I noticed looking through the bios that some of you actually are not represented in this slide. So I apologize for that. 1975 is the start of the SEER registries, so that's where we started counting cancer survivors in this way, at least um, in the United States. And so um, what you can see in this graph though, it, what we specifically updated most recently is that brown bar, that is a new bar, and that is the bar for people who are 25 years or more from cancer diagnosis. And as you see, it is growing. Pretty amazing. <laughs> so I know many of you are in, in that, represented by that ground bar, and um, we'll be using this figure now going forward to make sure that um, th that population of very long-term survivors is counted. The other thing that we did with these updated numbers is we decided to try to ask what proportion of the U.S. population is represented by cancer survivors. This is where you take your estimates for the prevalence of cancer survivors by sex and by age. So you can see along the bottom, zero to 39, 40 to 54, 55 to 64, and then the older age groups going to the right. And the bars represent the percentage of people living in the United States in that sex and age group who are cancer survivors. The light blue bar is where we are today. So you see where we are today, for example, among people 55 to 64 years of age is a prevalence of about 9% among females and about 16% among males. That means 9% of the US population in that age group in women are represented by cancer survivors and 16% of men are cancer survivors. And as, your, as you, your age goes up, that proportion increases and over time the proportion increases. So when you look at the dark blue bars, those represent what we expect to see in 2040. And as you can see, the numbers are going up and the proportion is going up. This is actually a question that people have been asking for a long time, <laughs> what, what percentage of our population uh, is a cancer survivor, and now we have some, some numbers to try to get at that. But the idea of being a cancer survivor is not something that resonates for every person. And I, I know um, among this group, you, you probably have your feelings that are different from among, for example, this young adult woman, where she said she thinks of herself as a breast cancer survivor. It's, an, it's a seminal part of my young adulthood but I feel differently about survivor in the context of having a glioblastoma, which is an incurable grade four brain tumor. So I identify as a breast cancer survivor, but a brain cancer patient. So this is, the reason I put this quote up here is just to acknowledge that we do use words. We, ha we have to pick a word, we use a word. It's not a word that is, um, resonates for every individual, and it's not a word that people may use themselves, people who have a history of a diagnosis of cancer. But we try to be very inclusive in the language that we use to set out our definitions in advance and to acknowledge that it just may not apply to every person in every circumstance. So we have this definition of survivor that comes from the advocacy community that says any person who's been diagnosed with cancer. And we came up with this figure a few years ago to try to acknowledge the different types of cancer survivors. So there are cancer survivors who are diagnosed with early stage cancer and who have a goal of care to be treated with curative intent. Then we have cancer survivors who are diagnosed with advanced or metastatic cancer or who progress from early stage to metastatic cancer. And then we have a group of cancer survivors who are diagnosed with or progress to end stage cancer. And this part of the figure represents the second part of our definition of cancer survivor. So we say a person is a cancer survivor from the time of diagnosis through the balance of life. And what that means is that even if a person is dying, they are still considered a cancer survivor. And the work that we do on behalf of cancer survivors includes work that, for people who are dying of cancer. This is a new definition. There's like 
10 definition slides, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but this is a new definition. We spend a lot of time on this question. As I said, we have to use words, you know, there's no perfect word. Um, but we started thinking about the idea of cancer survivorship. So we know that a cancer survivor is a person, but what about this idea of survivorship? It's all of the things that happen to people in their families who've been diagnosed with cancer, the perspectives that they have, the needs that they experience, and all of those challenges, including physical, psychological, social, and economic. So when we say the Office of Cancer Survivorship, we don't just mean the office for people who have a history of a diagnosis of cancer. We also mean the office that is here to address, inform, support research on all of the experiences, needs, perspectives, healthcare needs of people who've been diagnosed with cancer. So that's cancer survivorship. So what kinds of things do we do in the Office of Cancer Survivorship? Well, number one, I will say, without a doubt, one of the most important things we do is support funding opportunities. So the Office of Cancer Survivorship is intended to support research on people who've been diagnosed with cancer, their families, the healthcare delivery around those people, and the most important function that the NCI has is giving out dollars for research. And so we do a lot of work either ourselves or in partner with other people at the National Cancer Institute and other people at other national institutes or centers that are included in the NIH to try to find ways to get dollars in the hands of researchers. We do a lot of meeting with advocates. I heard that Shelly can't be here today. She's not feeling very well, but she is someone who we work with very closely along with other advocacy groups. And that really goes back to our history as an office. And it's pretty unique, actually, at NCI. And we have other people at the National Cancer Institute coming to us and saying, how do I connect with people who have been diagnosed with the problem I'm trying to address? And so we really consider ourselves a leader in that advocacy relationship, and we work very hard to maintain those relationships and to be responsive to advocates when they tell us about something that they're observing or they're experiencing. For example, when I first started at the Office of Cancer Survivorship, I had this updated definition that Deb Mayer had handed off to me. I knew I wanted to try to bring some attention to that population of people living with advanced metastatic cancer. And so I went to Shelly and I said, can you help me talk to some people who are living with cancer, find out what they're experiencing, what they want to see, what they need, and also what words we should be using. And so we went, she set up a meeting, I met with it about um, a dozen survivors, people living with cancer, and they told me they wanted the word, they liked the words living with cancer. They thought that that was an appropriate way to reflect the experience that they were having. They didn't really like the word survivor, even though we use it, we have to use it. Um, but that was one way that we, I, I felt we could get directly informed by people who were living with those experiences. And so we do those kinds of things um, all the time. But anyway, that's one of our activities. We also go and meet with members of Congress. Just a few weeks ago, I went down to Capitol Hill and met with a group of staffers from, from people who are in the Childhood Cancer Caucus in Congress. Every once in a while, they want to hear, what are you doing related to the STAR Act? And I'll mention that again later. What is NCI doing to support research in cancer survivorship? And so from time to time, I have to go and tell people what we're up to and what we need money for. Um, we also do a lot of our own research. So I myself came up as a researcher. Kevin Effinger was my mentor, continues to be my mentor. Um, and you saw some of the results um, that are coming out soon out of the Office of Cancer Survivorship. So we also do our own research. We try to do research that is, has a national um, audience and really is, accomplishes something that couldn't be done in an individual hospital or by an individual researcher. We do a lot of informational webinars. I'll just mention since June is National Cancer Survivor Month, we have a webinar coming up June 18th which is called Survivor Voices, which is for people who are, um, have a history of a cancer diagnosis and have used that to do something in their lives. So we have someone who started a nonprofit, we have someone who started a podcast, and that's June 18th coming up. 
If you want to sign up for that, you can go to the OCS website, which is survivorship.cancer.gov. And lastly, we support investigators. So this means meeting with investigators, going to meetings, finding out what research they're doing and what they want to get supported, and trying to match investigators to research dollars that are available. But when we talk about survivorship research, what do we mean? So cancer survivorship research, our goal is to enhance the health and well-being of people who've been diagnosed with cancer and their caregivers. And we come to this goal from a lot of different backgrounds. This is actually one of the greatest challenges of survivorship research and also one of our greatest strengths. We represent people from lots of different disciplines. So you have several people here who come from a general medicine background, but there are also people who are epidemiologists, who are health behavior experts, who are trained in social work. I don't see Sophia, but I know she's somewhere. Yes. And, um, and people and who are rehab medicine physicians. So we have people from lots of different disciplines who are working in this field. And then we have lots of different things that we need to address. So as you saw in our definition of cancer survivorship, it's all the experiences, all the perspectives, all the needs of people who've been diagnosed with cancer in their families. So that means we have to work on not just acute side effects and long-term effects from treatment, but also healthcare delivery, financial impact, health behaviors, methods and measurements. And then we have to do work at lots of different levels. So we want research that informs policy. We want research that's informed by the community. We want research on teams and how to make a best team that can support survivorship research. As you know, at su support survivorship care. As you know, survivorship care takes lots of different types of providers. Actually, Larissa just had a National Academies meeting on this issue where they're trying to figure out ways to support um, multidisciplinary teams for people who have been diagnosed with cancer. And so that is an, another area we have to work on. So all of these things are considered survivorship research. Sorry. So, okay, so that, <laughs> that brings me to our um, grant portfolio analysis. And this is something that we've published on. We publish regularly on our portfolio. That was actually one of the things that survivors and researchers told us that they want is real-time information on what is being supported by NCI in the field of survivorship research and what the gaps are. So as <laughs> I don't need to go again through what survivorship research is. So um, the most recent survivorship portfolio analysis was published in 2022. I'm going to use our methods from that paper. But we've also published since then on our portfolio focused on health equity and health disparities. We have published on our portfolio focused on primary care research in cancer survivorship. And we have a paper coming out on survivorship research in um, rehabilitation and um, medicine led by Rochelle Brick, which I'm sure Dr. Stubblefield knows. Um, so, but I'm gonna go over our methods from this 2022 paper, which was the overall survivorship grant portfolio. So we looked at everything that had been funded from fiscal years 2017 to 2021, and we pulled out the scientific focus, the study design, the target populations, and other grant characteristics. And the, the main intention with this work was to identify gaps for future research. One of the ways that researchers can get dollars when they apply for funding to the NCI is to point out when the NCI has acknowledged a gap in the portfolio or has asked for research on a specific area. So putting out this work is a way to support investigators when they're applying as well. So we looked at all of the um, research and project grants, including R and new mechanisms, PO1s, SC1s, and SC3s. We did not include um, training grants, and I'm gonna actually talk about a training grant in a little bit, but they, they tend to have aims which are a little different than your typical research study, and so they're, pretty, they're difficult to lump together with these other types of grants. We looked at research focused on survivors and informal caregivers, and we wanted specifically studies that were addressing secondary or tertiary prevention for cancer-related toxicities, assessment or surveillance of cancer effects and treatment toxicities, intervention studies to address cancer and its treatment, and health services by providers, patients, and caregivers. 
And what we found in the portfolio, which was about 550 grants, was that a little over half were the R01 mechanism. This is considered the backbone of scientific research, the most common mechanism by which studies are funded through the NCI. What we saw also was that over a third of our studies were supported by multiple PIs. And I, I can explain a little bit more about what that means, but the, the, what I want you to take home from that is that this is a field that requires people to work together from different, from different backgrounds. And so when you come in with a study to NCI with multiple PIs, it's because there is not one principal investigator who can represent the sum total of what you're trying to accomplish in that grant. So that really reflects the fact that our science requires people from different backgrounds, different disciplines, and we have to be able to meet each other, to support each other, to make connections so that we can submit research project grants and get funded in our work. And we do have about 28% of our portfolio represented by early stage investigators. So what that means is that is a person who is closer to their training, who has not previously had an R01 or equivalent type study before funded. And what's important to know there is that there is this whole community of young junior faculty who are coming up and being supported by their first grant at the National Cancer Institute in cancer survivorship. It's a large number of investigators and we, we support them specifically in a few ways, which I can mention. But it's, it's important for you guys to know that that's there. We also heard over the years that there is um, a, not enough focus on intervention research. So a lot of what we know about cancer survivors comes from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study and elsewhere, which are primarily observational studies that keep track of cancer survivors and record the kinds of things that they're experiencing. And those kinds of studies are called observational studies, where you're just watching, you might be doing a survey, you might be bringing survivors in for some sort of assessment, but you're not delivering an intervention. You're just trying to capture what's going on for those people. We find that still about 40% of the survivorship portfolio is represented by those kinds of studies. What that means is that there is still a lot that we need to learn just by paying attention to cancer survivors observing them and trying to capture what their experiences and needs are. So that remains a huge part of the portfolio and a very important um, part of our research. About 60% of the studies that are supported are intervention studies. These are things like psychosocial and supportive care, lifestyle or healthy behaviors, and care delivery studies, where, for example, you might be trying to connect survivors to risk-based care. That would be considered a care delivery study. Um, about 4% of our studies were implementation science grants, and I'm happy to explain more about that, but for years people have been saying we need more implementi implementation science in cancer survivorship research, meaning we need to find interventions that have worked in non-survivor populations and bring them to cancer survivors and test them. And that really has not been done very much in survivorship. And there's a number of reasons for that. And I did write a, a paper with our head of implementation science, David Chambers, to try to address some of those issues hard on, but I'm, I'm face head on, but I'm, I'm happy to address them later if you have questions about that. What are the kinds of outcomes that we're looking at in these studies? Well, number one was physiologic. And physiologic is actually an umbrella term that we use to mean anything that is a medical or surgical outcome. So for example, if someone experienced heart failure, that would be considered physiologic. A, a subsequent malignancy fell under physiologic. All of the medical, surgical um, experiences that survivors had. And that remains the most common outcome in the studies that we're funding. The second one is psychosocial, and I think we can all acknowledge that things like psychosocial needs and health-related quality of life are very important um, outcomes and should continue to be supported by the NCI. So what about when I looked at studies that were focused specifically on Hodgkin lymphoma? So <laughs> I'm sure you know that Hodgkin lymphoma is not a common cancer, and in fact, doing studies that are purely limited to people who've been diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma is quite difficult. So although Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma survivors are acknowledged as really the backbone of survivorship research, a place where a lot of lessons have been learned in this field, we don't have that many studies that are specifically focused only on this population. 
When I looked at the broader lymphoma portfolio, I did find a lot of studies that included Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. And I also found a lot of studies that include multiple types of cancer survivors, for example, breast, colorectal, prostate lymphoma, including Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. But there aren't very many studies where they really are looking specifically at the needs, the experiences, the side effects of treatment among people who've been diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma. So from the National Institutes of Health, I found this low-dose tamoxifen study. This was Melanie Palomares and Smita Bhatia. Many of you may have heard of this study. They published their outcomes. The idea here is that among women who had chest radiation and are at increased risk for breast cancer, you could use low-dose tamoxifen, a five milligram dose, to try to ultimately prevent breast cancer. The outcome in the study was um, breast density and other markers of breast cancer risk. And they showed that they were able to accomplish that in the study. That study um, has been published, it's completed. I will say as low dose tamoxifen has moved into breast cancer treatment um, more widely, so five milligrams of tamoxifen is now commonly used among women who have a history of DCIS, LCIS, or ADH. I think we will see more uptake of low-dose tamoxifen in women with a history of chest radiation. But historically, it's, it's, tamoxifen has a lot of side effects, especially at the high dose. And so it really hasn't been um, taken up in that population. There, um, I wanna skip the K99 for a second and jump down to the R21 and the RO3. So I had to go back a few years to find that RO3, but I did find quality of life in older long-term lymphoma survivors, and that is Dr. Sophia Smith's study. Um, and then the K99 comes from Anna Lynn Williams, who some of you may have heard her name before. She um, did her training at St. Jude and published on the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study. And now she's moving, and St. Jude Life. And now she's at the University of Rochester for the second part of that work. So this is an active study where a young person is currently being funded in a training setting to, um, to build a career in cancer survivorship research. And her study, her training study, is aging-related biomarkers of neurocognitive function in long-term Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. So this is not in my talk anywhere, but I'm sure many of you have heard this idea that cancer treatment somehow causes accelerated aging. The idea is that when you are diagnosed and treated for cancer, there are some aging markers, aging mechanisms that are turned on. In this study, she's specifically looking at inflammation and oxidative stress. But there are other things that happen as we age that appear to be turned on by cancer treatment. One of the things, and this is an area of active research for NCI, so her, her work falls under that umbrella. I also wanted to mention a couple of studies that are not from the NIH but are funded um, in the United States, one through the Department of Defense. This is assessment of clonal hematopoiesis and its relationship to cardiovascular disease in Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. This is a very interesting study. You may, I don't, I don't know to what extent you've heard of clonal hematopoiesis, but this is the idea that in all of our cells in our blood, there are some changes that can occur in the red blood cells that don't raise to the level of leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, but that represent abnormalities. And we have observed that in people who've been diagnosed with cancer, you can get more of these abnormalities after cancer treatment. So this is a study specifically looking at that question funded by the Department of Defense. You might be wondering why is the Department of Defense interested in clonal hematopoiesis in Hodgkin lymphoma survivors? And that is not a question I can answer. <laughs> No, I will, no, 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 that's not fair, that's not fair. The, the Department of Defense actually, um, as a result of um, heavy advocacy from Fran Visco and others, um, many years ago took on some um, interest in cancer survivorship research. They mostly focus on, um, I'm sorry, on cancer research. They mostly focus on breast cancer, but they have other studies that they support as well. So the DOD is supporting this one in particular. And then there's a study in, um, out of Texas, actually, which is state-funded, looking at the effect of chest radiation therapy on cardiomyocyte turnover. I also looked internationally to see 
what is funded on an international level that is specific to Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. I, uh, some of you may know actually some of these investigators who are supported by this work. The Norway Regional Health Authority has to study the effects of a structured follow-up program of long-term Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. And in the Netherlands, there were two different studies. These are led by Flora van Leeuwen, prediction tools for Hodgkin lymphoma patients to weigh benefits and harms of different treatment and survivorship care strategies, and Biobank of five-year lymphoma survivors as a resource to examine susceptibility genes and biomarkers for late effects of cancer treatment. And finally, in Sweden, they have a study on childbearing. Child, and we, we have seen some results of this study coming out already. Childbearing after modern day intensive chemotherapy in young adult Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. So there were a few things that I just wanted to say in general about Hodgkin lymphoma survivorship. And I know I'm only the first speaker today, um, but I'm happy to talk about any of these going forward. But these are kind of my um, take home messages or um, what I think is most important right now in the field of cancer survivorship related to Hodgkin lymphoma. So of course, as the number of survivors are growing, so is the field of survivorship research. And it, actually, if there is one take home from this talk, what it should be what I said at the very beginning, which is that all of you have a home at the National Cancer Institute. It's the Office of Cancer Survivorship. It's my office. So you have now someone at the NCI who you know who is working on your behalf, who wants to find out what you're experiencing and what you don't see represented in the research that's currently being conducted. This field is very supported. We have, a, we have an office which is actively growing, actively hiring, and where the dollars are going up as the number of cancer survivors go up. So I want you, that is really what I want you to know from this talk, all the other stuff aside. Um, our concepts of survivor and survivorship are growing and evolving, and they will continue to do so, and that's the nature of our field. And advances in cancer diagnosis and treatment with discovery and understanding of new risks will always drive our work. With that in mind, I wanted to say something specifically about Hodgkin lymphoma. So we, we need to acknowledge that radiation therapy remains central to the treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma for many people today. So the hot radiation therapy is not going away as a treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma. And if you look up these references that I have below, especially that very last one, Con, that is a paper led by Sharon Castellino, who you may have heard of. She goes through the current treatments for Hodgkin lymphoma and how they decide what path, what clinical trials, what um, therapies a person with newly diagnosed Hodgkin lymphoma is eligible for. And what she shows in that paper is that if you want up lasting cure from upfront therapy, you very likely need to include radiation treatment. So a lot of times when survivors come to clinical programs, they have this feeling like uh, something was done to me or what happened to me would never happen today. And I just think it's important for you to know that it, radiation therapy is still being delivered today to people with newly diagnosed Hodgkin lymphoma. There is also this recognition that doxorubicin increases the risk for breast cancer. I don't know if, you all, if that has made it to your circle, if you have heard from your providers about that risk, but that is a risk that was observed actually by Kevin <laughs> in the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study. We owe a debt of gratitude to him, continue to owe a debt of gratitude to him. Um, those first papers that came out on people who had breast cancer after childhood, childhood cancer treatment who had not been treated with radiation therapy suggested that there was an increased risk. And then there have been some subsequent papers that I listed there below that confirm that doxorubicin does increase the risk of breast cancer in people treated for Hodgkin lymphoma without radiation. And in fact, it's not age related. So in contrast to radiation therapy where younger age at treatment or age around being treated around menarche appears to increase your risk of breast cancer, for women who got doxorubicin in young adulthood or adolescence, it doesn't appear to be issue related. 
We also have this entirely new way of treating Hodgkin lymphoma, which is through um, checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapy. So there are new treatments like brintuximab that many of you have heard of, and we need to make sure as we're doing survivorship research that we've learned our lesson and that we keep track of people who've been diagnosed with these new therapies. Um, so that we know what kind of side effects they can affect, expect in the long-term setting. So that's really the future of Hodgkin lymphoma survivorship is what are those um, new therapies contributing to in terms of side effects from treatment and late effects. And then there is this whole field of science which is related to shared decision-making, communication, trust, where we really need to see more research in the Hodgkin lymphoma survivorship arena. And of course, of course, health disparities is an emerging uh, area and has been a focus for many years, but has not gotten enough attention in this population. I, I wanted to close with a few slides about why I think this work is important. I think you can tell from how I talk, I love this, <laughs> I love this field, I love my job, I love this work, and I'm not alone in feeling that way. So we have on our website some words from investigators who have been fun funded in survivorship by the National Cancer Institute. And these are, these are words from Erin Van Blarigan. She says, cancer survivors' experiences and perspectives have a profound influence on my program of research. She's not a clinician, but that's, she's telling you why it's important to her. And then when we think about why this work is special, I know for a lot of investigators who are working in this field, they've had personal experiences, either they themselves are cancer survivors or they have family members who have been diagnosed with cancer. And it really gives us a feeling of commitment and involvement in the field, which you don't actually see in other fields of medicine. I will just say cancer research and in particular cancer survivorship is truly special. So Lori Sakota said, my commitment to advancing etiologic and translational research on lung cancer is driven by the loss of my father to the disease, now over 30 years ago, and the recognition that lung cancer continues to touch the lives of many as it remains the leading cause of cancer mortality. And then on our website, survivorship.cancer.gov, we have a section of the website which is cancer survivor stories. That was a section that was there before I started, but we have been growing and adding stories to that section. And I would encourage you to go and look. Tell me what you don't see that we need to um, get some stories on. And this is a story from Bob, who is a cancer survivor. He says, there is not one right way through cancer, and you have to be aware of what makes sense for you. This is that um, director series webinar that I mentioned coming up on June 18th. I really hope you will join us. You can uh, register at our website, and these are the speakers who we're going to be having. It is so important that we continue to hear from cancer survivors and that researchers have the opportunity to hear from cancer survivors as they think of ideas for new projects and apply for funding to the National Cancer Institute. Thank you. Thank you.